All right, guys, this is Steli Afti uh, with Close.io. I'm super thrilled and excited uh, to do this webinar with you guys today, talking about the unscalable startup and actually using old school basic business techniques and basic common sense to actually grow your business at a much faster scale than trying to do everything with scale and scalability in mind. And this is very much an anti-trend to a lot of things that are going out there. And I'm going to share some very personal stories, things that we do at Close.io that are not scalable, but help us outcompete our competition and deliver more value to our customers. But I'm also going to share stories from other companies I admire and other brands I've learned from and we've learned from that have really pushed this idea forward. And I also want to highlight that uh, some of the first you know, thought leaders, unsurprisingly on this topic, have been people like Paul Graham, uh, PG. If you actually Google Paul Graham and then do things that don't scale, you'll find an amazing article about this. Um, you could find, if you go to the 37 Signals blog or if you Google 37 Signals, uh, why we're doing things that don't scale, you see some more thought leadership on this. So we're not the first ones to think about this or write about it, but we care deeply about the idea of the unscalable startup and unscalable tactics. And I'm going to share some real secrets today and some real uh, insights. Before I get started, let me give you a little bit of a background. Um, so the company that we started a few years back um, was originally offering a service called Elastic Sales. And what we did is we offered startups and technology companies, usually venture-backed ventures, in the heart of Silicon Valley, a scalable sales team on demand. What we honestly did is we offered outsourcing services, but in many, many cases, even more than just outsourcing uh, services, we actually offered uh, consulting services. We helped companies in the B2B space that had to sell to customers that had a product revenue and that wanted to scale their sales operations. We helped them actually through this sales exploration phase, figuring out what works, what doesn't work, what experiments to run, what results and benchmarks to look for. And then once they figured it out, we helped them to go to the sale to the actual sales execution phase of now growing what's working and actually scaling their sales. So we work with over 200 venture-backed technology companies on the sales side of things um, running Elastic Sales. And the cool thing is that today we're known for a company called Close.io and a product called Close. And that's probably how you guys heard about us. And what's interesting is that the way we built Close.io is actually the prototypical way of being an unscalable startup. Uh, because what we did is actually we build a product based on our experiences on doing consulting for others and based on our own needs in order to actually fix our own problems. And those two things by default seem very unscalable, right? Fixing your own problem, well, you're only fixing a problem for one person, right? For sure. <laughs> like you, it, you, the, you might assume that if you have this problem, others will too, but you don't really ever really know. And a lot of people love to think about their market first and then invent something for that market. Well, I want to like, there's a billion people in China, so let me do something Chinese people love so I can sell to a billion people. That's the, the scalable, like scaling is the very first step of the uh, you know, journey of your startup. And a lot of times that step is so big that you're never ever able to actually take it. Um, the other approach is a very unscalable one, which is asking yourself, what the fuck is my problem? And let me fix my problem. So at least I know I'm fixing the problem for one person that will really like what I've done, mainly myself. And once you fix your own problem, what you do is, what's a very smart tactic, is to actually go out there and do consulting, help other businesses that you think would have a similar problem and help them fix those problems one by one in a very manual fashion and get actually paid for that. So you're actually getting paid to figure out what the real solution uh, to the problem is, what the real problems are, and, and to actually figure out and do customer development and lean startup in a way that's actually profitable in a way that's very intimate and close to your customers. And that's what we did with Elastic Sales. We helped all these companies do sales. We helped all these companies scale sales. The process, we learned a shit ton about what companies care about, what they struggle with, what their problems and pain points are when it comes to their sales software and their sales processes and their sales needs. And at the same time, we needed software that allowed us to scale and grow and manage and perform better on the sales side. And we needed software that empowered the individual salesperson to actually do a better job. So that's exactly how we built Close.io. We built it for ourselves. And once we built it out for ourselves, we tested it with many, many, many other companies out there. And we actually not just tested our software, but we actually learned a lot more about what they care, their struggles, their challenges. We really became experts 
leading experts when it comes to startups and entrepreneurial sales. And that translates into a radical un unfair competitive advantage. And that translates to everything we've done that's truly valuable to people today. All right, so that a little bit of our, our story. Now, uh, you could say, yes, Sally, you know, cool, cool story, bro. Like, nice that you think you're awesome. <laughs> nice that you did it that way and that your bias now projects that everybody should be doing that way. But obviously, we didn't invent these concepts. We weren't the first ones to do consulting and transition to a product company. We weren't the first to fix our own problem uh, and, and find that many, many other people have that problem. And a lot of the other strategies that I'm going to share with you guys we didn't invent these ideas. These ideas have been around forever. And we had a lot of role models, startups, companies we truly deeply admire that have been doing these things and have showed us the way and we just followed. Like we just copy everything that we think is awesome and we see the results and we see the difference it makes. So um, many of the, the tactics that I'm gonna share with you guys are tactics that are stolen or copied or inspired by some of these companies uh, that are shown this this slide. Companies like Airbnb that started doing what we call today quote unquote growth hacking, which basically is like, you know, coming up with crazy unscalable ways to actually like grow your user base by going to Craigslist and actually finding people that are looking for space or offering space and a, and and actually approaching these people and telling them about Airbnb and getting them onto the platform over to companies like Uber, who's like killing it today, just like Airbnb is. But when they first started, the very first thing they did was actually doing a bunch of cold calls to black limousine companies, pitching them on the idea of being part of their service and seeing if drivers would actually want to be part of this. That's the very first thing they did. And once they did, you know, a hundred cold calls and of the hundred cold calls, like uh, a ton of people, I don't even remember, 10, 20, 30 drivers said, fuck yeah, I'd be interested in participating in the service. They knew they're onto something. And that's when they actually started building things. Um, other companies like uh, Craigslist, obviously, which is like driving hundreds and hundreds of million dollars in revenue, but it's like a teeny tiny team. I don't even know how many there are today, but probably less than 50 people. Um, and competing effectively with you know giants like eBay and many, many other sites around the world. Uh, and Stripe that, you know, in the early days and for the most, the, I think for the first one or two years where there was no support team, where the founders themselves 24-7 were available through a live chat giving support. 37 Seagulls, Wufu, I'm going to bring up a lot of great examples here, uh, but there's a lot of companies we admire that have uh, deployed these tactics and have are currently and constantly winning in the market and creating amazing customer relationship by being unscalable startups. So let's start with the basics, back to basics, right? A lot of companies today, and especially startups, we want to fly before we fucking learn how to walk, right? We want to build something. And from the get-go, we want it to be something 10 billion people will love. We want it to be something that's going to IPO next year. We want it to be something that's going to be gigantic immediately. Or oh, it's not even worth our time. And that's where the problem lies. We don't, we, today, too many entrepreneurs are not mastering the basics before they're trying to get into advanced techniques. And too many companies don't master the basics, learning how to actually crawl and then walk before attempting to fucking fly. So let's talk about the basics. When you get started and before you get ever started building anything, building any kind of product, building any kind of thing uh, that you could imagine, you need to learn how to pitch before building product uh, and products. What that means is that you need to actually go out there in the real world and figure out if people actually care and give a shit about what you want to do before you actually go and do it. Because doing it is wasting a lot of time. Doing it while lacking the insight of how exactly people care about this and what exactly they need is going to lead into bad decisions and bad choices, which will ultimately derail the chances of success of your company. So what you need to learn how to do is to actually pitch before you build products. Uh, you need to go out there and sell the idea, you know, make a drawing, ask people, get feedback, really get your hands dirty, follow that like whole customer development and lean startup philosophy before you ever build anything. Elastic Sales, when we got started, we didn't build a website, we didn't have a name, we didn't have a logo, we didn't have a presentation. We had the idea and one day later, we started cold calling companies, pitching them on the idea to get the market to educate us if they actually gave a shit and what their objections would be and what their challenges would be and if we could actually get a customer. And once we got customers, then we came up with a name, a logo, we put up a website and we did all these things that startups love to do first. We love to build shit 
come up with a logo, a name, brainstorm a website, start a blog, you know, create a Twitter handle, all that crazy vanity bullshit that's like superficial, but not talking to potential customers, not actually going out there and uh, actually selling your idea, pitching your idea, getting real feedback, getting real buying before you actually build anything. And here's the hierarchy of the way that you need to think about this. Um, you know, the 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 least thing you can get, the least thing you can get as validation back when you pitch whatever you're doing is people saying, I like the idea. That's at the lowest level of the pyramid in terms of how valuable it is for you. People saying, yeah, I like the idea. One level above people saying, I like the idea is people actually saying, I would buy this. I would pay you for this. I would give you money. And the only way that to get people to say that a lot of times is to actually ask them, hey, would you be a customer of this? Would you actually buy this? Would you actually give me money for this? So first, you know, the, the, at the lowest level of feedback is people saying they like it or level B, above that is people saying they would buy it. And a level above that is people actually giving you money. And now I know what you think. You think, well, but how could I ever charge for something that doesn't exist yet? Easily. You just tell people, hey, if you really deeply care about this, a way to make sure that I actually get to build this and build it in a way that you want and with the priorities in mind that you have is to put down a deposit. And you know what? I'm going to make it worth your while. I'm going to give you a lifetime discount of 50%. We just decided that the product will be priced at whatever, $200 a month. You're going to get it for $100 a month for life because you're one of our first customers. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to prioritize some of the things that you told us you really need and make sure these things get done first. But to make that work, we need you to put down a small deposit. It's fully refundable. It's, you know, whatever, $500, $1,000, $5,000. Uh, you can, and, and which will help us actually develop these things faster, uh, move things in the roadmap in a way that aligns with your goals. And then within two months, we're going to launch exactly what you want. And if we don't, you can get your money back. And if at any time you change your mind, you can get your money back. That's the Obviously, that's like the black belt of validation, getting people to pay you before you have built things. But things like Kickstarter show that even in the end consumer space, people are spending money for things that don't exist so that they support their realization and the manifestation of these ideas into real existence. They say, I want this to exist, so I'm going to pay money to make it so, to support it. You can do that in, end in the end consumer space. You can do that in the B2B space even easier. Pitch before you build products, all right? And with that, as a little side note, an asterisk, always pitch, always sell. There's no way to outsource sa sales, especially in the B2B space. There's no magical viral formula you're going to grow and become this massive beast. No, you have to fucking sell. Right? You have to learn to go out there and convince people and pitch people and get their feedback, listen to the reaction to their body language, get all the signals, bring them back, and, and let those influence your decision-making process, your product roadmap, the things you do and you don't, and the way that you prioritize things. All right, now you're saying, well, okay, this is how we build. So this is we first pitch, we go out, we do customer development, we, we, we get ideas, and then actually we start building things. But sometimes even building things right after you got validation might be a, a, a step uh, too quickly. A lot of times, especially when it's internal processes, you actually want to throw humans at the problem first. You want to actually first figure out if we actually, does this solution, is this solution really the right solution? Is this solution really going to make a difference? And can we find an unscalable way that's fast and quick to get us results and data to take that data and results and actually base decision-making based upon that? And I'll give you a, a quick example. When we started building Close.io and we had all these salespeople doing all these sales calls, at some point we started asking ourselves, hey, a predictive or, or a, an auto dialer or predictable dialer um, predictive dialer, how valuable would that be? And here's a quick note on what that means. If you do a lot of cold calls or sales calls, there's technology that actually allows you to create like an auto dialer. It's like a, a calling queue so that the moment you hang up a call, the next call picks up. And the, the moment you hang up that call, the next call picks up. That actually is supposed to allow you to be a lot more productive, make a lot more calls. Now, one level above that is a predictive dialer. And what that makes is you realize that a lot of times when you do cold calls, you waste a lot of time listening to dial tones voicemails and talking to people that are not ultimate decision makers, people that tell you, well, yeah, uh, you know, I'm the secretary of so-and-so and what is this all about? And he doesn't have time right now. She doesn't have time right now. Whatever, 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 right? Um, you're wasting, you know, 70, 80% of your time with cold calls, not pitching, not actually selling anybody shit, right? You're wasting your time with Dalton's voicemails and gatekeepers. So 
the predictive tile, what that does is it's a technology that actually allows software to make multiple calls at the same time, and then it drops the calls that go to voicemail automatically, and then it only picks up when a human being picks up, and it routes that pickup instantaneously to a sales rep. So what you can do as a sales rep is, boom, you hear somebody say, hello, the, my name is John, and then you can start pitching. The moment you hang up the call, the next call is immediately somebody on the phone saying, hey, this is Jenny, and then you can start pitching again. So that obviously boosts productivity crazily. So we were wondering, should we build this like auto dial and predictive dial technology into our core product to actually help our cold calling team um, really reach way better numbers? So here's what we did. Instead of start building this shit for weeks and weeks and weeks without really knowing how much it's going to move the needle, we threw some humans at the problem. What we did is we said, you know what, let's test this out. Let's get a bunch of temps temporary workers. We called the temp agency. We got like five people to show up the next day. For we bought five uh, wireless headsets, and here's what we did. This is really, really like ghetto style, but it really worked. We actually had human auto dollars. What we did is we had like two or three people temps call uh, leads in cold call leads, and for every two to three temps, we had like a, a real sales rep, a real account manager sitting next to them. And here's what's happening: every time that a temp actually uh, got to a real human being, they would actually pretend that they're the account manager. They would say, hey, this is, you know, Steli Afti from blah, blah, blah. Can I talk to so-and-so? And when the other person said, yes, I'm so-and-so, they would actually take the wireless headset and just hand it over to the sales rep next to them. And the sales rep next to them would take the wireless headset and actually continue the conversation seamlessly as if they it have there would have never been another person on the call. They would just go, hey, yeah, so I wanted to talk to you about this cool new brand new idea and blah, 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 blah. And so this is crazy. People, it blew people's minds that you could have one person say, hey, I'm Steli. And then the next person continue as if that person is Steli. And people were saying, well, didn't people notice that these were two completely different voices? No, they didn't. You know why? The human brain does some magical shit. Sometimes when things make no sense, the brain to make your life easier actually changes information to, you know, make your life simpler. So the brain will actually say, well, this voice didn't match that voice. And then it says, well, forget about it. It seems like it was some kind of a glitch in the matrix and life just goes on. We did thousands of these calls where one guy with a completely different voice would hand over the phone to another guy and the entire conversation was pretended as if there was only always just one person on the phone call and nobody ever called us out. I think once or twice somebody said, you sounded like a totally different person. And then we would just say, well, I don't know, maybe it's my phone. And people would laugh and the conversation would go on. But what that allowed us to do is to actually have multiple people pretend their predictive dollar doing all these calls, handing over the wireless headsets to the sales guys and us getting real data, real results on like how much does it actually move the needle to have a predictable dial, dialer before we actually build it. So after a few days of doing this, we had all the evidence and all the proof and the real hard, cold truth, dollar amounts of how much more money we could make with a predictive dollar. So you know what we did? We actually built it. You want to throw humans at the problem before you actually build things. Because more often than not, this is a successful case, but more often than not, when you throw humans at the, at the problem, you do, you know, you have a bunch of freelancers or a bunch of people on Odesk do something manual. Uh, before you automate it uh, so that it can scale. More often than not, once you do the manual work, even if it's really slow and painful, you realize it's not worth doing in the first place. Or you realize there's a better way of doing it. Or you realize that you shouldn't be working on this thing right now because it shouldn't be a priority. So before you build and automate shit, do it manually and through humans to the problem, ask yourself, can we kind of fake it until we make it? Can we find a way to have a bunch of humans perform this task before we actually build machines and technology to do that in a really automated and scalable way? All right, so now you, you, know, you, you pitch before you build a product, you are throwing humans at different ideas and issues to figure out, to do the manual work first before you actually automate anything to figure out what makes sense or what doesn't. But now that you have a product, you surely want to start really do a B testing and set up a B test and set up all the analytics and buy like fucking five books and courses on Google Analytics and set up your funnels and set up your KPIs and your metrics and in install mixed panel and all that other shit and really become a data driven superhuman geek 
uh, because that's going to allow you to scale. That's going to give you the magic of wisdom and you're just going to know everything about everything and what works and what doesn't. But just leaning back and looking at like five massive screens with like moving data and trend lines going up and down. Isn't that the the kind of illusion? Isn't that the the pipe dream we all have is like, we need to be data driven. We need to look at analytics. We need to do A-B testing. We need to be more numbers focused. Well, yes, but no, not at the beginning. Nothing, nothing at the beginning beats actually watching human beings interact with your software. And when I say watching people interact, I'm not saying sitting there on your laptop looking at real-time clicks on shit. I'm talking about standing behind a real human being, seeing them struggle finding the fucking sign-up form on your website or seeing them struggle once you've logged in or signed up for your product. What the fuck to do next? Like nothing beats looking and watching human beings in the natural habitat actually interacting with your software. Um, especially in the beginning. In the beginning, you really don't want, because you don't have scale yet, you don't have thousands and thousands of people doing things, so you're five visitors a day, what the fuck do you want an A-B test for? Like, what did five people do, version one versus version two? I see, all, I see this all the time where startups and entrepreneurs wasting a shit ton of time doing stupid shit, setting up analytics and metrics on day one where all they would have to do is take their fucking laptop, go to a Starbucks, tap on somebody's shoulder and say, you know what, next coffee, next fucking latte is on me. Can I quickly have you uh, try out this product or try out our app or try out this new thing that we're doing? You know nothing beats that. The kind of insight that you're going to get and the visual, like, painful emotions you're going to get when somebody is, like, super confused about your app, when people click on things and they break, when people are completely misunderstanding your product and saying, oh, this is really cool. I can do this and this with this. Oh, this is very interesting. And you in your mind think, holy fucking shit, no, you can't. Like, no, this is not what it was meant for. You don't know these things when you just look at clicks. You have to look at people. You have to watch people to gain real, to, to be in as, as a contextually rich environment as humanly possible. It's great to actually see clicks. It's better to actually um, read what people think uh, while you actually look at what they do. It's even better when you hear them, what, hear what they think while they do. It's even better when you can actually see them. It's really sometimes... Somebody sits there and they do all the right clicks and they actually interact with your app in a really powerful way and it seems like they know what they're doing and it seems like everything is going smooth, but their facial expression is one of deep, massive pain. And then you ask, uh, hey, you seem to not enjoy yourself. Uh, what's up? Do, 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 did I get that right? Is there something wrong here? And they'll turn around to you and they'll say, you know what? Yeah. Yeah. This is really painful, like, uh, like this is really complicated. And nothing in their behavior other than their facial expression would have given you that data. They clicked on things. They seemed to know what they're doing. But internally, they were living through hell because they really didn't like the experience. Go and watch people. Don't watch clicks, especially in the very early days. Once you scale to tens and tens of thousands of, of concurrent users, yes, you need to set up analytics and metrics and look at all that data. But still, the value of actually watching people using your product can never be beat. There's nothing that can beat that in terms of the richness of data and signals you're getting. Uh, so you always, always have to be out there standing next to people using your product and seeing how they interact with it, seeing actually how they feel about it. Nothing could ever beat that. So forget about A-B tests, forget about KPIs, forget about like fucking installing all the metrics and having a massive analytic dashboard. That's all great and you know, that's all awesome and all important, but you need to actually watch people use your product. Nothing beats that. All right, so you have a product, you know, you, you pitched your ideas, you found out what people like, you built some things. Uh, you know, you're now looking at people actually interacting with it. So you're getting some real data on what works, what doesn't work. Now you start having actual people signing up for your product, right? And, and here's a thing that drives me crazy is that startups think that the phone is fucking evil. Now I know we all on Snapchat and WhatsApp and all that shit. And we, I know that we all live in our in email inboxes. And I know that we all love the comfort of our own desk, looking at our own screen and responding to things at our own time. But... Human beings ultimately and forever will want to buy things from other human beings. And data, the, the value of data when people write you and when you write to people is a completely different set of, of data than when you actually 
hear them speak and even better when you can actually see them and you get a lot more clues, a lot more information, a lot more communication, not just the, the, the content of their words, but also the context in which they say it, the way they say it, their tonality, their body language, all these are clues that give you data that's really important for your business. What makes me crazy is that founders and startups today think the phone is uncool and calling people is totally old school and doesn't scale. Well, fuck you, right? Because we're calling people all day long. And it fucking, you know, you know what doesn't scale? What doesn't scale ultimately is being clueless. What doesn't scale is ultimately building things that nobody cares about. And what doesn't scale is having people confused and no way for them to actually figure it out. The other thing that doesn't scale is building a product that lacks personality in human connection and then having the expectation that your customers will be loyal and that people will give a shit. That's the shit that doesn't scale. But what definitely does scale is human connection, human emotion. So pick up the damn phone and actually call your signups. How about that as a crazy idea? How about calling signups within five minutes of signing up to welcome them to the trial or your product to say, hey, I just wanted, hey, John, I just saw that you signed up for our product two minutes ago. I wanted to welcome you. I wanted to personally take time to say welcome. It's awesome that you took the time to sign up. You're obviously awesome because you're one of those guys that give us a chance. Let me know if there's anything I can do to make you more successful. Let me, let me know if there's anything I can do to answer any kind of question. What kind of an impression do you think you're creating when you're actually making the effort to connect with people? You know what? With Close.io, every day we close deals just because of the pure fact that we're actually calling our signups and our trials. And people are telling us, you know what? Nobody else is giving a shit. Nobody else called me. Like I signed up for five of your competitors' products. Nobody gives a fuck. You guys actually picking up the phone, calling me, saying hi, saying welcome, off, going the extra mile. You know, I'm already decided I'm going to go with you guys. You're the type of company I want to build or you're the type of company I want to do business with. Pick up the phone because on the phone, you're going to be able to actually create an impression, create a human connection, build a relationship show that you give a shit, and also you're going to be able to get a lot more information again, right? So when people say, when, you could ask people, hey, why, you why did you sign up? Now, I know that you could, in a scalable fashion, put this in a sign-up form and have one of the tabs say, how did you hear about us? And then people can select one of like 12 fucking options. But when, you, when, when I select, how did you hear about us? And I look at the whole thing and it says, my friends, and I click on that, cool. Now you know that somebody did word of mouth for you, but that's all you know. If you're actually on the phone with somebody and you're like, hey, I'm curious, how did you guys hear about us? And he says, oh, you know, uh, my brother told me or my colleague told me or my boss told me, that alone is a lot more information. Oh, shit, your brother. Is your brother in the business? Do you work with him or her? Do you work with him? Tell me a little bit more. Why? What did he say about us? Do you know how he found out about us? Let me actually send a quick email to your brother. What's his name? Oh, I see him in our system. Let me send a quick thank you note that he actually is a good brother and told you about us, right? Let me send him a quick note, a quick thank you, a quick gift. Do something to these people that actually do marketing for us and recommend us to others. There's so much more data. There's so much more knowledge when you actually have a real conversation human to human with another person. So pick up the damn phone and actually call some of your signups and actually see what they're doing. And now, again, I know when you ask people for their phone number, Conversion rates go down, but in the beginning, this doesn't fucking matter. What matters is for you to actually learn how to crawl and walk before you want to fly, which means you actually learn how your market operates, how your customers think, what they care about, what they don't, what confuses them, what, which one of your marketing tactics actually makes a difference, which ones are a waste of time, what in your product confuses the shit out of people, what doesn't, why they like you or don't, and why they give you money. Like These are the things that you need to care about. You can s optimize conversion rates later. Now, at the very beginning, you need to optimize for doing shit that's worthwhile doing, you know, and really deepening your understanding and becoming an expert, intimately related with your customers, your market, the problems you're solving and building real relationships with people. All right. Once people actually decide to buy your product, you want to onboard them like a fucking boss, right? And this is a concept that's new and we're still experimenting with this. And there's some companies that are doing this out there that, that I got inspired by. So a lot of times, one of the hardest things, especially in B2B, is to actually get started with a product. And a lot of times, some products actually really require you to do a lot of fucking work before you can actually get value out of them. So I'll give you an example. There's two email automation startups. One is called Drip. You can find them on getdrip.com. The other one is called customer.io, where to get value of the, out of these 
transactional uh, automated email systems is you have to put a lot of data in there. You have to connect them with your, your real database of users. You have to actually write template emails for all these different use cases. You want to write a welcome email. If somebody hasn't logged in in seven days, a, hey, what's going on? Can we help you email? When their trial expires, hey, do you want us to offer you a trial extension email? There's all these amazing behavioral emails you can write depending on what people do or don't do. And, but at the same time, this is a lot of fucking work, right? You have to write all kinds of templates in emails, you have to decide for all kinds of rules. When should somebody get this email or not get this email? You have to connect these systems to your database. There's a lot of work involved before you can actually get some something out of it. And get drip for instance in the early days what they did is they focused a lot on like email courses in order to capture leads so they would give you a little form that told people hey give me your email address and i'm going to send you a nine part email course on startup sales success by the way we actually do this you can go on close.io click on free startup sales course and actually uh get nine you know i think it's even more than that get a bunch of emails get a full course into your inbox uh, you're learning more and more about sales and startup sales. Anyways, so what they did is they, that you could create that form from their system and then you could s set up the sequence and put in the emails and people could get that course for you. Now they realized, get drip, uh, or the, the drip guys realized that it's really fucking painful to write an email course. So here's what they did. They offered concierge services, onboarding. So what they would do is they would actually tell you, you know what, dude? If your business has a blog with a lot of content and you want to use Drip and you want to create an email course to capture more leads, we are actually going to take that blog content and we're going to curate it. We're going to create a course out of it for you. We're going to sequence it, put it in the system for you. So all you have to do is you have to point us to your fucking blog. You have to sign up on our form, lean back, and a few days later, your fucking course magically appears in the software, right? This is obviously crazy valuable. And could you imagine that a, a person that has to do all that work themselves versus a person that doesn't, that there's going to be differences in A, how emotionally invested people are, how excited they are, how taken care they feel, and how many more of these people will actually use your product forever because they're getting shit ton of value out of it? Yes. These concierge services, this concierge onboarding, this intimate one-on-one -on -one unscalable onboarding is really, really fucking powerful, right? Really powerful. And this is something I see more and more companies do. Uh, I, there's a blog post. If you go to customer.io, and if you click on their blog, I think the most recent blog post they have is how offering concierge onboarding, actually having a human being onboard you one-on-one, -on -one, put in the emails in the system, help you, consult you, make sure to answer all the questions and make sure that you really quickly get everything into the system and get real value out of it, how that has dramatically impacted their conversion rates and how many people actually turn into customers. You need to start thinking about this more and more. If you have software that's not super easy to use for everybody and people actually have to do some work, like with Closeout, getting leads into the system or setting up systems or setting up uh, you know, custom statuses or, or workflows, you want to offer consulting, you want to offer concierge onboarding, one-on-one, -on -one, take care of these people and actually make them really, really successful. All right, now that you have customers and things are going well and you're onboarding them like a boss and uh, you're, you're actually looking over their shoulder to see how they interact with your product, you'll have to actually give them support. A lot of times when people think about support, how can we scale support? Well, let's fucking outsource it, right, to some foreign country, and we all imagine these like this, this, you know, uh, this massive office floor with like hundreds and hundreds of worker bees doing like on headsets doing like you know outsourced support for large businesses, and we all know that the experience fucking sucks, right? So we have companies and role models like Zappos that has all their support team in house, and that actually empowers their support team to not just be a cost center, but actually an awesome center, a center and a, and a department in the business that creates awesomeness, that creates amazing, incredible experiences, and actually is the focus of the way they build their business. But it's not just Zappos. Stripe, as I mentioned in the, uh, at the beginning of the, the webinar, Stripe, that is a multi-billion dollar company, it's kind of killing it when it comes to startup success. Stripe, for the first one or two years, they were really small and trying to figure things out, trying to go through all the complexities and pains of building a payment system. Stripe actually offered 24-hour access to, to their engineering team as support. And they had a live chat that customers could enter and ask questions when they need help at any time. And the people that responded were everyone. 
The, the team was small. I don't know, four or five people, the founders and a bunch of other people. All of them gave support 24-7. They actually had it set up. So if they were sleeping and somebody was writing something in support chat, they would get a call that would say, go fucking into chat. Somebody has a question. Everybody in the company needs to offer support. And the kind of support teams are not like these large, you know, outsourced, you know, support call centers somewhere in India, but support teams should look like this. It should be your entire team. The entire startup needs to be on support. And the importance there is again, multifolded right now. I know it doesn't scale. I know it's going to slow you down. If your engineers are answering support questions all day long, they won't be able to build products. If you're on support all day long, you won't be able to close big deals or get investment or get press or do other things. There's a cost associated with support, but there's also a massive, incredible benefit, especially in the early days, but I would argue actually forever, but especially in the early days, you know, doing support yourself is unscalable, but the things you're gonna learn what people struggle with or not, feeling the pain of your customers, feeling people being confused, upset, outraged, unhappy, unsuccessful with your solution, feeling that pain is actually going to be crucial to your building and prioritizing what's needed, what needs to be built next. No, but you cannot outsource that. The other thing is that it's going to allow you to an opportunity to actually really create relationships, go the extra mile, make people wow people when they're most ready to start hating you, which is when they usually need support. That's when we start actually turning the page and actually starting to have negative feelings towards the companies that uh, we bought products from and became customers of. And that's usually where most companies disappoint us is we bought this, you gave us all this amazing advertising sales, you did all this dance to create the relationship and create the conversion and have me buy your product. And now that I'm a fucking customer and I have a problem, you don't give a shit anymore. This is your chance to stand out. This is your chance to actually go the extra mile and show your early customers you deeply care. So they should also deeply care about you. They should forgive you when there are, there are bugs in the system, where things go down, when things don't go smoothly, which inevitably is going to happen. You're a startup. A lot of things will go wrong. And you need customers that are willing to forgive you. The only way that they will ever be willing to forgive you is if you gave a shit about them, if you cared, if you were there for them when they needed you most. You can't be like, yeah, but it's not scalable, so I cannot really help you with this problem right now. It's just send us an email or just fill out this form and somebody may or may not respond to you within the next few days. No, fucking be accessible. Uh, have an all out chat on your website so when people have questions, they can talk to you. Have a live chat room, hip chat, or whatever other tool you want to use that, that you, you link up everywhere in your product. When people have questions, when you have a question, you don't just send an email. You can actually click on a link and chat with us. You get live access to our engineering team, to our founders to ask your questions. You get to talk to people that know how to fix your fucking problems, right? That really creates relationships. That creates real knowledge and insight and, you know, makes sure that, People are not disconnected from their customers. Like nobody's more empowered than an engineer that feels the pain of a customer every single day. It might be a feature that an engineer wouldn't want to build, but if he talks every single day with a customer that, that says, this fucking sucks, this is making my life suck, the engineer will get really quickly motivated to fix this problem. Maybe they'll do an extra sh shift at night. Maybe they'll take a few hours on the weekend and fix that problem, make it a priority because they're talking to people and it's, a, it's humanizing the issue. The other thing, I know some people might think, well, but, you know, I'm the founder, I'm the CEO, I'm the most important developer or designer resource we have. Surely I'm too important to do support. No, you're fucking not, right? You're not more important than Craig. You really are not. He is a guy that built a multi-billion dollar company, even if he's never going to sell it, uh, that's worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, although he doesn't live it you know, and live up to that and doesn't have that kind of lifestyle. He's a guy that's like as humble as can be. And his job is not even CEO of his own fucking business. His job is customer support rep. That's what his job title is. He's a customer support representative. All he does all day long, customer support. If he can do it and if he's not too important to do that, you're not too important to do that either. All right. Now that you've, like, these are the early sta stages, the early steps. How do, you, how do you come up with an idea in an unscalable way? How do you actually develop that idea in an unscalable way? How do you build it and improve it? How do you onboard people? How do you support them? But even, you know, 
but, but even once you've actually reached some level of success and you're making millions of dollars in revenue and you're having thousands of customers or users and you're like, the business is growing and it's bigger and it becomes more and more painful to do unscalable things. You know, because unscalable things take time, are manual, take hustle, take grind. Very quickly, you're going to be tempted to say, well, that was the past. Now we have to look into the future. Let's switch the scalable, you know, whatever uh, uh, switch and hire outsource support, hire shit ton of people, do everything just metrics and numbers driven and lean back and just look, the business, look at the business as it grows and scales. No. You know, the way to win in business is by doing what others don't. The way to win in business today is to go the extra mile, is to humanize the interaction, is to actually stand out in a crowd of faceless fucking corporations that have scaled everything so it's fucking efficient and optimized, but nobody gives a shit about you and none of their customers give a shit about them. That's not the way to actually build businesses in the future. If you want to stand out, if you want to create relationships, and experiences that stand out and then create real fucking fans, people that are passionate about what you do and how you do things. You want to do things that others don't. So first, start actually visiting your customers. Once you start having customers, how about actually going there and visiting them in person, just like you would with a good relative or your family. Now, this is a little bit of a painful one because the crazy thing is, I've been reading about people visiting their customers for ages. And it seemed so obvious that I didn't pay attention to it. It seemed so obvious. Yes, this is not like a mind-blowing hack idea, anything that stands out. Visit your customers. This is so obvious that you, you don't even really parse and compute that sentence correctly. You don't really think about it. You just The words just go in in one ear and out in the other. And you're like, just, uh, okay. You know, what, what exactly should I do with that information? This is so obvious. It's like, breathe in air. <laughs> cool. So what? And you know what? At the same time, when I ask a room full of founders, how many of you guys have visited a customer in the last six months? Almost nobody raises their fucking hand. And we ourselves, for over a year, had not visited a single customer. Not a single customer. You know why? Visiting customers is painful. It takes time. That's why it's painful. Like I could either work, go through my inbox, write a blog post, uh, do some interviews, improve the code, design some new thing. I could either do some real work, quote unquote, or I can have to take the train or take my car, drive, you know, an hour to a customer, you know, wait for the elevator, fucking go up there, wait for the founders to come and then chit chat for an hour, you know. It might take me an hour to get there, an hour to spend with them, and an hour to get back. That's three hours if you include like lunch and breakfast. That's your day. Your day is gone and you visited one or two customers. It seems too painful of a sacrifice. It seems too big of a sacrifice. It seems that it takes too much time. It doesn't scale. It's too manual. Can we just like, I don't know, can we just have a little thing in the app that says, Hi, I appreciate that you're a customer. Like, can we just fucking build something that's scalable to everybody um, that kind of replicates that relationship shit? No, you can't. It took us over a year to actually do this. The first time we visited customers, this is crazy, is not in our own backyard or neighborhood. It was actually when we were in Europe. And you know why? Because we were saying, well, we will never be able to actually visit these customers. We are in Europe right now. Let's actually make this more productive since we're speaking at these conferences and actually visit some customers in the area. This was a way for us to make time more productive because we were traveling already, right? How crazy is this? We weren't visiting the customers that are like 10 minutes away from us, but the ones that are fucking, you know, uh, uh, 10 hours away from us on a flight. And the experience was magical. It was truly powerful. Like when I was there, in my entire system, I could feel like, holy shit, I can't believe this is the first time I'm visiting customers. All this shit I'm learning, like you will learn, you will actually really get, again, much more context about what's really going on with your customers. Actually seeing their office, seeing the way they work, seeing the different departments and people and their dynamics with each other will give you so much more information about your customers, so much more information about like what's really going on and really truly understand their business a lot better and be able to actually service them so much better by, by being there and getting all that context richness in your experience. The other thing is that you're actually going to be able to do what I told you to do beforehand is you'll see all these users, all these just numbers, 
turn into human beings right in front of your eyes. You're actually going to be able to see people using your product in their natural habitat, not even in a Starbucks uh, with like a user testing, but in actually at their work, like sitting there using a computer and you see your software on their screen. Nothing is more inspiring. Nothing is more motivating. Nothing is more powerful to see that and see what people love about it and what people struggle with. And the other thing is you're going to be able to build relationships. We are human beings. As human beings, we're relationship-driven creatures. You know, it's easy to say, this software fucking sucked. We're going to cancel today and go with another software. But it's hard to say, Stelly sucks. Although I like him, he made a mistake, so I'm canceling his ass, and I'm going to find me another person to build a relationship with. People are a lot more forgiving once you actually saw them eye to eye. You shook their hands. You sat down there. You talked about business. You laughed. You chat about your challenges, their challenges. You went the extra mile to try to help them with some of the problems they had. You showed that you care. You know, if you visit a customer and two days later your system is down, then like the likelihood of them not canceling versus a customer that didn't see you is so much higher because people start caring about you. People start actually having human emotions about you and, and creating real relationships. So visiting your customers is actually going to make them stay longer, spend more money with you, be more loyal. It's going to make you understand your customers a lot more intimately, their business, their the entire context of their team, their challenges. And it's going to also show you how people use your product in real life. A lot of times it's shocking. A lot of times when you actually look at somebody using your product the first 10 minutes, you can learn a lot. But when you see a customer who's been using your system for 10 months, that's also really, really insightful and valuable. Sometimes we saw people use Clothesio in ways that is crazy. It's just painful. People doing things with a software that is just obviously broken. It's obvious that people don't know how to get to something in a more elegant way. So they created these workarounds that are painful to watch. There's no way to know that by just doing user testing with new users. There's no way to know that by just looking at numbers and analytics. You actually need to sit in an office and see real people that have been using your software for months and months and months and see what kind of workarounds did they find to the challenges that they had? Visit your fucking customers. And again, like a, a, a confession I want to make, you know, we visited all these customers back in Europe. I came back all motivated, trying to schedule a bunch of visits in person, made a bunch of them. And it's been months again since I've been visiting customers. And I wanted to visit customers every single month. This is pissing me off about myself. This is something that I need to be a lot more disciplined about. And we as close as a company need to be a lot better about uh, but I promise you we'll get there and we'll force ourselves and we'll make it a habit. And I can only encourage you to do the same. Here's another crazy concept. How about saying thank you to customers? How about saying thank you to the people that are paying your salary, to the people that are making you relevant in the world, to the people that are making your business successful, to the people that are allowing you to hire more people, scale, raise money, eventually sell and build a fortune or make a change in the world, whatever it is that you care about. How about saying thank you once in a while to these people for dealing with all your shit, for trusting your solution over other solutions, bigger competitors, whatever it is. How about saying thank you once in a while just for the fucking hell of it, right? Say thank you. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk wrote a really awesome book called The Thank You Economy, where he writes about why he believes through the web, we're actually not moving into a more futuristic, more robotic future, but actually going back to basics of business, small town business where people knew each other, where people cared about each other, where businesses couldn't just screw over their customers because there was nowhere to hide or to run. And he talks about the value of actually creating um, those experiences and the value of thanking your customers and creating these kind of gratitude and this kind of intimate appreciation for them. And for a while, I think Wine Library, I don't know if they still do it, that's the, his wine business. Um, it's a big, big wine company. And what they were doing is whenever somebody bought, I don't know what kind of orders, what, whenever somebody became a customer, they would have a thank you department, basically a little call center team. All they, their job was, was to call new customers and thank them. And that was that was the end of it. They would call and say, hey, John, I just saw that you bought, you know, became a customer of ours. I want to personally take time and say thank you. And that's it. And people usually said, uh, sometimes people were rude to them and were like, yeah, okay, but I don't have time. Like, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Just thank you. Thank you so much. All right, have a nice day. They would hang up and, and people would get call them back to apologize that they were so rude or confused and that they've never experienced this before in their fucking lives that a company would just call to say thank you and that's it, right? 
What kind of experiences does that create, do you think? What kind of stories does that create? Here's another company I fucking love, Wufu, another YC company that became sort of famous for doing something that is so old school, but is so fucking awesome. They actually, once a week on Fridays, they would take time, they would assign this, I think, to different team members to spend like the entire afternoon on a Friday to write handwritten thank you notes to customers. And, you know, they were all quirky about having all these dinosaurs on the website because, you know, dinosaurs are awesome. So they would put little dinosaur stickers on these things and they would really write real like notes, not just like some automated printing press that's saying, thank you for being a loyal customer that's being sent to millions of people. Again, that would be scalable. No, they did it the unscalable way, handwritten actually caring and carefully crafted by a human being that knew something about you. What kind of an Im impact impression do you think that had? All kinds of people like posting about this, tweeting about this, sharing it. They became famous for that shit, for th writing thank you notes as a online business, right? Never, never, ever underestimate the power of saying thank you. It might not quote unquote scale in your mind, um, but it's gonna make an incredible impact in the way that you do business, the way that people do business with you. And then uh, another one, uh, something that we like to do a lot, something that, again, we learn from others is actually offering office hours to your customers. So here's the deal. You're not just in the business of providing your customers with software and solutions. You're actually on a much higher level in the business of making your customers successful. If, you know, and, and, and I stole this from a company called HubSpot, a marketing automation company that was saying, you know what, our, our job is not creating great marketing software, our job is to make people awesome marketers. If you think about it a little bit more broadly, all kinds of opportunities come up and the strategy and vision kind of changes in a much more powerful way. Yeah, software is not the end all be all. Software is a vehicle to make people better marketers, but that's not the only thing. We can teach them and write courses and do webinars and, and share our knowledge with them and do, what else could we do to make people better marketers? Because if the best fucking marketers in the world are our customers, we're the best fucking marketing business in the world. And, you know, the ROI and revenue will follow. If we turn mediocre marketers into awesome marketers, these people will never, ever fucking leave us for anyone. Doesn't matter if something else is a little cheaper in price. Doesn't matter if something else is like shiny new. These people will remember that we help them become fucking amazing. They'll never leave us. So if you are in any... It, it, you're in a specific market, right? You are doing your shit. Uh, you know, in our case with Closeire, we ran a, an outsourced sales force for startups. We did sales for 200 startups. We built sales software that is, you know, used by thousands and thousands of salespeople around the world. We know a shit ton about sales. Why not use that knowledge and offer it to people so they become better salespeople, so they become better sales organizations? That's the whole purpose of our blog. Um, if you noticed, all the blog posts we write, all the core answers we give, all the shit we do is to teach others what we know and make our customers and, base, frankly, the entire world better at sales. And Office Hours is just a really impactful way to do that. What you do is you basically offer, you know, Maybe at the beginning, it's 60 minutes. Uh, you know, once too many people want it, you might scale down to 30. And I just had to recently scale down to 50-minute slots where anybody can book a 15-minute slot, get on a call with you, describe their problem. In our case, describe their sales problem or their sales challenge or their sales questions and, and, and us offering them help and advice for free. You know, offering them coaching and insight and hindsight and some consulting, helping people be better at their job. You know how many of our customers came through office hours? You know how many of our customers stayed because of the office hours we, we offer them? And not just do, does this create great marketing, great branding, um, puts you out there as a thought leader, uh, empowers your customers to be better customers and better what they do, but it's also like just great for you, again, learning more about the world, learning more about your space, your market, your customers, getting real insights of what the challenges are that they have. Like office hours are... One of the primary ways that we get ideas for what we should be writing about, right? Uh, I do a bunch of uh, office hours. The next thing we do, we start writing fucking blog posts because I answered all these questions. I had all these challenges and this points me to new ideas on what to write about and what people might care about. Offering office hours is an awesome way to market, to create new content, to create thought leadership for your business and to empower your customers and build really lasting, impactful relationships with them. And here's a little story that I want to share to, to end this session with, uh, almost end this session with, um, which was 
Uh, the very first office hour that we had with Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator, most people, if you're in a, in a webinar that's about the unscalable startup and unscalable tactics, I assume you know who he is, so I'm not going to introduce him. Uh, PG is fucking awesome. The very first office hour we had with him, we told him we had already launched the product, we had some user growth, although it was a little, it was the first week with, I don't know, 10 people sign up with a credit card. It was for a completely different business, so not close out. This was a, a company called Swipe Good. And... He asked us, hey, guys, what is the one thing, the one number, the one metric that really defines if your company is going in the right direction or not? Is it really traffic? No. In your case, it's not. Is it really just like signups or users? No. In your case, it's not. What you really, truly, truly, deeply care about is fully enrolled uh, people with a credit card. So we had a service that allowed people to sign up with a credit or debit card. And then every time you purchase something, we would round up that purchase and give that change to your favorite charity. So all we cared about were people that actually gave us their credit or debit card credentials and they were rounding up their change and actually donating money. That's the only people we really, that, that, those were the people that actually showed if our company was progressing or not or having success or not. So PG said, all right, if that's the number, if that's the people we really care about, let's only talk about them. Forget any kind of other goals. Forget kind of any other KPIs and metrics. Don't, don't do anything else other than promise me this. Can you promise me to grow 10% week over week during the three months of Y Combinator fully enrolled uh, uh, credit cards, uh, uh, credit card signups? Can you promise me a 10% growth rate every single week? And we said, fuck yeah. We shook hands on it. You know what happened? The very next thing that happened is I asked PG, hey, PG, do you have your credit card on you? <laughs> right? We had 10 users at that point, 10 fully enrolled users. So I knew 10%, that's only fucking one user. Let's fucking get this thing done right now. And you know what he said? He said, and that's exactly why you want to focus on one number. It's like, yeah, he, he couldn't find his credit card. So we signed up with the y, the y Combinator corporate card on SwipeGood. And then we looked at a couple of other partners to sign up with. And he said, you see how this like being single-mindedly focused on one metric, one goal will clarify everything. This will answer all your questions. Whenever you ask yourself, should we build this feature or that feature? Ask yourself, which feature will actually help us grow 10% next week? And then do that. Do only the things that will help you accomplish that number, that one single goal. That Single piece of advice was probably the most powerful piece of advice I had in my entrepreneurial career, and it changed everything we did. We actually hit 20% week over week goal during the three months of Y Combinator. We printed that fucking growth on T-shirts on our demo day. It was like a nice little hockey stick. And uh, we we're t telling investors, you know what? You could invest at this point where the curve, the, the curve was really like flat, or you could have invested at this point, or now you can invest at this point, or in a year, you know, we were projecting into the air. We're like, this is going to be, you know, where we're going to be. So it's, it's your decision when you want to join this train, but this train is going up. Um, you know, obviously there's a little cocky, but it worked. It worked really well, but not just for that, for product decisions, for all kinds of decision-making, you know, you want to simplify decision making and you want to make it simple to decide what's the most important next thing to do and prioritize out of all the possibilities of what you could be doing if you scaled in all kinds of directions. No, scale back, focus on one number that clarifies and creates clarity and priority for everything you should be doing. Um, and with that, one last little idea that I want to share before we go to Q&A is being an unscalable startup and doing unscalable things is really all about, in many cases, it's the, about the art of saying no. It's about creating not just to-do lists for yourself, but not to-do lists. Deciding what you're going to not focus on, what you're not going to be building, creating an anti-roadmap. Not just like, here's everything we want to build, you know, and, and that list just by natural momentum gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And more and more and more items get added to the fucking to-do list and the fucking roadmap and product roadmap and product to-do list. How about going the other direction? How about doing what others don't and actually saying no to things, actually making really hard choices and creating a list of things you're not going to work on today or creating a list of things you're not going to build that are not going to be part of your product, that are not going to be part of your future. Um, doing it that way can a lot of times create very different results and many times a lot more amazing results because you're going where other people are afraid to go. You're, seeing, you're making hard choices where other people are afraid to make them. That's ultimately going to be the big difference between building something people truly want and care about and love and building a business that truly makes an impact and a difference in the world and building something that in, 
in theory could scale because all, you have all the metrics and you've built all the features and you automated all the steps and you've uh, you've outsourced all the work but nobody gives a shit about your solution nobody cares nobody buys you're completely irrelevant doesn't matter if in theory you could scale all right thank you guys uh, that was uh, that's the end of the the webinar the unscalable startup you can always get in touch with me Steli Afi Steli S T E L I at close.io if you have questions if you want to challenge me and you know what guys I'm actually writing more and more about the unscalable startup and this kind of anti trend to everything needs to scale and automate and be fucking technology driven but actually bringing back the human touch and the grind and the hustle. And, and going the extra mile for your customers. So I'm actually writing a lot more about this and I'm considering taking some of that writing and potentially turning it into a book. Um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs will benefit from that. So if you have stories or examples that you wanna share that are fitting into that unscalable startup theme, please share them with me, write about it and share that content or just uh, send me an email and let's jump on a Skype call and chat about that. Um, thank you so much. I hope a lot more people and a lot more companies do a lot more unscalable things to be more awesome. Uh, I'm signing off on the recording side of things, but we're going to jump into the Q&A session uh, just right now.